Record scratch. These are not the best days of our lives. My goodness gracious. Welcome to an all new So Bad It's Good with Ryan Bailey. This is your pal Ryan and this is your Thursday episode. We're doing a Vanderpump Rules episode four recap. Did you know we're doing an episode four recap? I can't believe that. <laughs> How the heck is everybody doing out there? You guys, I got to just tell you, I... These crazy kids have put me in quite a foul mood. You know what? I was not planning on that Tom Sandoval New York Times article. I knew it was coming, but I wasn't planning on it. And I think between that and then I just watched the Vanderpump Rules after show, which they have on Peacock. It's like a 20 minute interview with the cast members talking about scenes from the episode that you just watched. And it infuriated me. It infuriated me. The the la la of it. You guys got to watch this thing, man. It's wild. And I think everybody, including myself, involved with Vanderpump Rule, we all now have doo-doo for brains. We literally, my brain is just doo-doo pudding up here. The, nobody is learning. Nobody is growing. Everything. Yeah, let's get every, everybody grace, everybody free. Listen, I just, I was thinking if, if I, I always think like, oh, if I won the lottery or if I had a time machine. And if I had a time machine, I used to think I would go back and try to give myself some wisdom. But no, the time machine now would be back like to go back like a year and a half ago and literally just be around Tom and Ariana and shout out, hey, Ariana, Tom uh, doesn't feel like a rock star in his own life. He doesn't want to be with you. Uh, you know, you guys need to break up now. And Tom would be like, oh my God, thanks for doing that, dude. And we could we could have saved all of this. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's be <laughs> beginning to be too much. Now, I was talking to uh, Sophie Ross, you know, my co-host on Mondays tweeted something about like, where, where's the, the show that we all, where, like, where's the good time show that we all used to love? Now, I argue that it was never the good time show. It was just that we were different and they were younger. So we thought, LOL, it's funny to watch young hot people be this twisted. And I think, you know, obviously what it is, is that we are all growing up the audience and them, except they are not maturing in any way and they are still doing the same twisted shit. So it kind of leaves you with this like deep pit because you lose confidence in them and you start to lose confidence in yourself. And you're like, Oh man, this is just a mess. We're never getting out of this. And like, I keep saying every episode this season, the show really works. If you actually think of it as they are chained to this show, they can't escape. They are forced to be around each other. I do not believe that these people are actual friends anymore unless cameras are up. I mean, sure, there's like certain relationships. I think Sheena and Lala probably talk or text on a daily basis. I'm sure Sandoval and Schwartz to some degree and maybe Ariana and Katie. But for like, why would you be? Why would you be? The, you know, it's I used to think Vanderpump Rules was great because it was like this friend, a real friend group as opposed to real housewives, which they were more cast friend, you know, friend groups where they were cast to be friends together. And they eventually wound up with some form of friendship. But it was always like, oh, at the end of the day, even when I was watching the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills uh, finale tonight, you know, Erica has this actually decent scene with Kyle at the very end. But then I was like, you know, in reality, Erica and Kyle, they don't talk on a regular basis off season. I mean, these are like pro athletes. They go and they hang out with their families or Morgan Wade or whoever it is. And then they come together for the next season and throw themselves back into the trauma. But I, I was watching that after show, you guys, and even this episode. And I think I have a suggestion. Maybe we just get a licensed therapist, not Dr. Drew, not anybody, not anybody famous, just a, not, not Jen Mann, who is Erica's therapist, just an actual therapist, doesn't really want to be on TV, but we force them to be there in every scene. I mean, I think this person, guy or girl, would end up probably hurting themselves after dealing with this mess. But I feel like we are now entering conversations about self-harm. We are obviously, um, you know, already entered conversations about cheating and relationships and, and all of this stuff. But I'm like, maybe the cast truly doesn't have a language. And as you get older, it gets darker. And that that's where the storyline this season with Tom Sandoval having these dark thoughts and everybody needs to take it easy on him. Maybe we do need a professional on set at all times. 
Uh, listen, I don't want to blame Lala or Sheena, nor do they want to be blamed if anything happens, but maybe there should just be somebody that everybody can talk to. They can even be on camera and be like, hey, can I just interject real quick, Lisa? Uh, it's kind of weird that you're placing this blame on Sheena and Lala, potentially. Uh, they should be able to decide if they want to be friends with Tom or not. But it's weird because... I feel, and Lala specifically comes in with these heated like declarations, like, oh, so passionate. It makes so much sense. And then she usually backtracks just as passionately, but it's a flip of the coin where it's not like a pit bull bulldog. It's like this gentle flower that understands human emotion completely. And then you're like, wait, what happened to that person that like so clearly, but angrily said what they said. And now, and I guess that's the range of human emotions. We all change. We all do that, but it's hard to then take Lala seriously because you know, then she'll backtrack on that sentimental thing, go back to anger and then rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. And we are just stuck in this groundhog day time warp on this show and I truly don't know where it's going to go. I mean, I truly, I mean, it's going to go on forever, obviously. It's going to go on until the end of days, but it's really weird to watch. Now, of course, Tuesday night's episode, there were so many really silly, funny moments. I don't think they meant them to be, but I mean, Billy Lee looking at Tom Sandoval coming out of a cold plunge, like it's a big old, you know, big old rack, like a rack of ribs, like, yee, yee woo. I have never seen somebody look at somebody. You would have thought Tom was like an angel coming out of a cold plunge. She was just like, I've never seen a man take cold water that way in my life. Whoa. Oh my God. He is an angel. That This is a miracle. Did you see? He said it was nine out of 10 on a pain scale, this ice cold water, and yet he withstanded it. And he walks amongst us. This Tom Sandoval walks amongst us. Tom, if you could handle the cold, walk on that water next, Tom. Walk on that water. You are just mm, a chef's kiss. Also, after the New York Times backlash, I do want to say Tom potentially is finally listening to the people that he have he's hired, his PR crisis counselors, uh, you know, because I saw a walk and talk. Um, it was a back grid interview where they caught him like coming out of like some store going into a store. And he was like, hey, Tom, Tom, what's going on, man? Hey, do you want to clear up any comments you made about George Floyd or OJ Simpson? And Tom finally goes, uh, I think I don't want to make any comment. <laughs> I think I don't want to make any comment on that. And then, of course, the backward reporter, we all know what they do. Hey, okay, cool, cool, cool. Hey, um, hey, you having any dark thoughts? How's your mental health lately, Tom? Do you want to comment on that? You know what? I I think uh, I think I don't want to uh, I don't want to do a comment. Hey, and finally, Tom, um, is it true that Ariana potentially did hit you and rip your necklace off? Uh, do you want to comment on that? Uh, I want to and you can tell he's fighting the urge. He's fighting the urge to explain himself. Uh, I don't want to make a comment on that. Ah! Was that so hard, Tom? You did it. You got back into your car and got to go away without saying anything incendiary, without placing the blame on somebody else, without, uh, you know, I, I thought that's the right way to go. Learn that phrase. Maybe like get a tattoo on you so you will remember, I, you know, sometimes people will put a rubber band on their wrist, like, you know, to like stop from cussing. Like every time they cuss, they'll snap that rubber band on their wrist just to remind them not to do it. I don't know why I came up with that example, but maybe Tom needs to tattoo no comment on his hand. So every time he looks down and somebody's asking him a question, he just sees no comment. Now, I did hear a rumor. I can't. This is just a rumor. But I did hear that Tom was supposed to be on Watch What Happens Live next Tuesday and that that has been canceled. We'll see if that's true. We'll see. I don't even know if you'll actually find that out. But on Watch What Happens Live last night when Tom Schwartz, which, by the way, I loved this is I love Tom Schwartz's little varsity jacket he was wearing. I like his style lately, like not not when he dresses himself, you know, in the the cheetah prints and the floor. He seems like it, it's like a it's like a. A younger, it, it, it feels like a, what is it? Like a skater version of Steven Tyler sometimes where it just looks like, oh man, you just like picked a bunch of things off, off your floor and just threw them on and, uh, and then you're good to go. Um, Tom Schwartz, I, you know, he was on watch what happens live. And I thought, oh, how is Andy going to deal with this? How is Andy going to deal with the New York times 
uh, article dropping, Tom Schwartz on Vanderpump Rules, they're going to have to say something. And Tom Schwartz, once again, is going to be left picking up the pieces for Tom Sandoval like he did his disastrous but hysterically funny Watch What Happens Live appearance during Scandoval. And uh, guess what happened? Nothing happened. They did not mention it at all. And I thought, you know, that's so interesting in so many ways. And it made me wonder, are they going to comment on it? Bravo Is Bravo going to com comment on it? Or is it going to be one of those pop culture moments where you just wait it out, you let it die, you see how soon people can forget about that? Uh, Tom Sandoval, of course, did release an apology yesterday. And uh, uh, let me find that for you. And I thought I thought it was it was fine. I thought it was, um, you know, I, I can't. Anyways, he apologized. You know, he tried to explain what he was doing, but he said he, he was, you know, uh, embarrassed by his sentiment. And and uh, it's fine. Now, uh, I do want to say I was on uh, Kristen Doty and her uh, dude Luke's podcast. Um Sex and What Else Matters, I believe it's called. Sorry, Sex, Love, and What Else Matters. And we did a recap of Tuesday night's episode. And I got to tell you, that's the weirdest thing ever. Like, I, I love doing it with those guys, um, but it is so weird. And I told them this to talk about a show where Christian has dated two of the cast members uh, and you're also talking to her current boyfriend and you just realize how dark that must be for Kristen on top of how dark the content is, regardless of who you're talking about it with. And I just led me to believe like, what am I doing with our, what am I doing with my life? What is going on? Like, this is sometimes you're really happy and you're like, oh, this is so exciting and fun and I'm working so hard and oh, what? And then sometimes you're just like, what, what are you doing, man? What, what is this? Is this, is this, is this it? This is, this is what you're doing. You're going to keep Oh my goodness gracious. But anyways, that's out there. I thought it was a really great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I was also on Jeff Lewis live extended, which is the after show after Jeff Lewis's. And that was really fun with Jeff and Shane. And I know Jeff has Sheena on today, this morning. So I'm excited to listen to that. Uh, I know Jeff is not uh, very schooled, I think, in Vanderpump Rules. So it'll be interesting because I know he was going to go back and watch some of the episodes of this season tonight to hear what he has to say to Sheena. But uh, I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm beat, you guys. I am beat. Um, also, there is so much content out there. So this is a two-part episode. I'm going to do this recap. Don't moan. Just listen. Because the second part of this episode, I have a conversation with Kate Casey. I was going to put it in this one, but it was like an hour and 15 minutes. I think it's a standalone episode, but we do talk about Vanderpump Rules, and she has so many interesting takes. But we also talk about Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, Real Housewives of Miami, Love is Blind. And Kate is, what, why I want it to come out tomorrow, too, is I want everybody to go to Kate Casey's live show next Wednesday at the Irvine Improv. Uh, Kate's always been a great supporter, I think, to everybody. Um, but it was always great to have her on. So Irvine Improv, February 28th at 8 p.m., um, so get tickets to that. So right after this, just click on over for part two of this. And it's a full conversation with Kate Casey, which is not just Vanderpump Rules, but everything else. And I think she is always amazing. Okay. Are you guys good? Are you, are you buckled in? Do you, you, let's just get going, right? Let's get started. Let's get through this mess together as a family. And uh, let's try to find the places where we can laugh like idiot, or at least I need to find the places where I can laugh like an idiot because my god and the men of vanderpump rules just stop talking do the show keep your head down and just get through it no more interviews listen rehabbing your image comes with time and distance and space and i am still getting chills from parts of that new york times uh, article and it's not even the comment about the oj and the george floyd and the danny masterson it's all the other stuff about how tom views his life and you just see that he is in this hyper reality of reality tv that his own life he lives three times he says and it's like maybe it's time to get that life down to living it one time and make sure you can do that as good as gold and then maybe throw tv on top of that yeah. Folks, this episode is entitled Dog Days of Summer, and this is the description dog because James gets his dog back at the very end. So Dog Days of Summer, and uh, this is the description the cable company gives us. 
James and James, DJ James Kennedy and Allie throw their first pool party at Casa Kennedy. Lisa Vanderpump gives Sheena and Lala advice. Was that advice? It felt like she was just pressuring. Wait, that was advice? Okay, cool. So that's the description that we are to go off of for what this episode entails. Okay, let's dig. So we start off with some fun, funky music. You should say if that's what it takes. Blah, blah, blah. And we do the round robin of all the cast members. Lala. And then we go over to Schwartz's place. And Schwartz uh, seems like he has a little home just gym system in there. And he's doing push up push ups in his living room. This guy is fully getting his Schwartz back. Um, really amazing to see. Uh, then you see Tom Sandoval shirtless brushing his old toothies. And then you see Ariana across the, the hall brushing her teeth. These people love dental care. Then we go over to Sheena and uh, Brox, and Brock's like, you're crying crocodile tears to Little Summer Moon. We keep going with the music pumping. We're just seeing streets and airplane, and we go to James and Allie's new house in Burbank. And he's like, woo, pool party day. It's not guys night. It's pool party day. It's a lot of work hosting for people. And she's like, I know, dipshit. Ali and I are hosting our first get together at our house today. I'm getting mentally prepared for it to be a host, the host of the day. Welcome to Casa Kennedy. Casa, Casa Kennedy. And he's doing these weird hand motions. He's like, I went to Home Depot. I went to Vons. I went to freaking Target. And the Target head is like, not only do I buy drinks and pool uh, drinks, I had to buy a barbecue. I had to buy fucking 12 towels. I probably spent at least like two grand on this party. He's a baller, folks. He's like, where did it go? The money. He's out there with Ali. He's like, I'm decorating for outside. And you tell Ali's like, yeah, do whatever you want, man. And she's folding towels. He's spraying her with the hose. She's like, stop, dude, stop, please. Allie feels like in a very, <laughs> she's about to burst. Now we go over to the modern farmhouse of Tom and Ariana's dungeon. I mean, house that they have to share together. By the way, does anybody else find it weird that, um, that they still have the Tom and Ariana photo in their hallway up the stairs? Like, isn't that just another reminder? I mean, just, is it, I, I wonder if they even realize it's there. Do they, are they just so used to seeing images of themselves? Like nobody thought to take that down. Like, let's, you know, like, I don't know. I, I used to have like, you know, all the like shitty movie posters you had in college, like half baked or something like let's put up a movie poster there or something. Let's take down the Tom and Ariana photo. Anyways, we zoom into Ariana's room, which by the way, this is bullying works, folks, even though I know they filmed this before we started saying she uh, was a hoarder, potentially. The room seems to be cleaned up and she's picking out uh, swimwear with Miss Katie Maloney who she is doing a lot of scenes with. And I'm sure that is also because they are opening the business, something about her. And they're just doing girl stuff, talking about should they wear a bikini, a one piece? What are we going to wear to Casa Kennedy for the pool, pay, pool party? So this is what women go through all the time, I imagine. I don't like to take my clothes off, so I don't have to worry about it. But Ariana reveals this story where she was like, me and Katie got into a lift after See You Next Tuesday. And when he dropped me off at my house, she says, I remember this house, the Lyft driver said, I dropped you off here before. And you and your husband were fighting. And then we cut down to Tom Sandoval, who's having coffee. He's like, oh, talk coffee. We go back up to Ariana. This is the Lyft driver, she says, from the night, March 1st, 2023, the night that the phone falls out of the pocket that started Scandoval. And she has to tell the Lyft driver, we're not together anymore. And the driver's like, that makes sense. And uh, the, the Lyft driver definitely had no idea that it's a thing. And uh, Katie Maloney's like, uh, have you ever heard of Reddit? LOL. Good old Reddit. <laughs> but also, do we really believe that um, Katie Maloney, sorry, do we really believe that Ariana, I, I just don't believe that this Lyft driver, I don't, I mean, I believe that this happened, but how did the Lyft driver not at some point. And by the way, Tom, you should listen to this of like one person in America didn't know about Scandal. It didn't hit everywhere like you thought it did. But this guy, I just, but also I think we're missing the point where Ariana was like, yeah, we're not together anymore, but we still fully live together. And the Lyft driver would be like five stars. <laughs> please just rate me five stars and give me a tip, please. This is traumatic. But I remember was it, was it, it, I think it was on Call Her Daddy with Ariana, where Ariana was talking about that night with this. 
and let us know like when all of this was happening, the Lyft driver, I think, stopped with them at like a 7-Eleven or something. And Tom wanted to get smokes or a drink or something. So they even made a stop when they were fighting. And I got to tell you, this Lyft driver, he doesn't seem to pay attention to pop culture. But if anybody knows this Lyft driver, here's the deal. And I just thought of this right now. I will give this Lyft driver $300 American. I'll pull out cat three hundred dollars if you will come on so bad it's good and talk to me about this night. I have never paid for a guest to be on this show before, but I need to talk about this Lyft driver. We don't even have to fully just talk about Ariana and Tom. We can just talk about how's business these days. But this is wild to me, and I do find it's like this is how you can never escape this show. You can never escape even when you think you, you the cameras aren't there and the Lyft driver is talking about Scandaball, is talking about, oh my God, I was here March 1st. Um, I just thought that was such a bizarre story. Anyways, Ariana's like, I thought Lala had some really great points tonight, but then Schwartz was like, you guys are ganging up on me. I'm like, three people have something to say and that means you're being ganged up on, Ariana says. And Ariana in a talking head's like, this guy that I haven't spoken to in, you know, and she's doing her hair in a mirror, however many months, all of a sudden is some sort of um, authority on who I am and how I live my life and what I think and feel. That's interesting. Just like a man. And listen, that is a read, right? That is it. But what's frustrating about this is knowing, like I enjoyed that talking head, but I mean, also thank God, uh, potentially that this New York times came out the same day that this episode did, because if it didn't, some of you guys, probably not my listeners, but some of the people that I read, you would have gone so fucking hard on Ariana for that talking head of like, look at her with a mirror, doing her hair, talking about Schwartz. Oh, you think you're the queen of this group? Like, listen, these are talking heads. We see props used all the time. This is a little bit of a bit, but also she has a point. Also, us men are complete pussies. Three people is not being ganged up on, period. Anyways, they start talking about the Tahoe trip for Lisa Vanderpump's Wolf. You've got to come to Wolf. Me and Nick Lane, we have made this wonderful, new, imaginary, sexy place for Tahoe locals and visitors. It's where you take the people you cheat on with. It's completely sexy. Remember, they're doing a trip for, I think, the opening of Wolf. I thought it was going to be this episode, but I guess it's going to be next episode when they go up. And Katie and Ariana are like, no, we're not going. Like, this is the thing. Like, Katie's like, no, I got shit to do. We're trying to open this uh, something about her. We're dealing with stuff. And also, that's like protecting your mental health. So Katie's like, I'm not going to abandon the work that I'm doing with the sandwich shop to jump on a trip that Tom Schwartz is planning. And then Katie in a talking head says, I would um, rather eat a jean jacket. <laughs> By the way, I think that's a slyly hysterical line. I would rather eat a jean jacket. You would rather eat denim. That's so specific. And if you think about eating denim, it really, it's like, it's how I pick. I hate cheese it so much. It's just dry. And I always think I'm going to choke on them with that little cheddar dust. And I know some of you freaks love it, but I hate cheese it. And denim, if you had to eat denim, it reminds me of a form of cheese it. So well played, Katie Maloney. But it's what I was talking about, about this show being this chain around all of them is in what world, even though Katie and Schwartz are cool, you, you know, a year and a half, two years, you aren't wanting to go on weekend trips with your ex-husband. You just don't want to do that. And also then you throw Sandoval into the mix and you throw these other yahoos like it's, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, of course I would want to see Katie there and Ariana for the drama, but Anyways, Katie's like, we got to get permits and licenses for beer and wine. We got to staff the place. We got our work cut out for ourselves. And she doesn't even know how true that is because then they end up having problems with the city. So anyways, Katie's like, I think there's a little bit of bandwagoning happening with this whole trip. And I think they both know Katie and Ariana because they've been on the show for so long. How this show works is that by design, it tries to force you together. We cut over to Villa Rosa and we have a shot of Hanky and Panky the Swans. Sheena and Lala come dressed up for DJ James Kennedy's uh, pool party. And I just have to imagine, listen, Lala and Sheena are both incredibly successful, right? From the show, from their podcast, send it to Daryl Mertz, the whole thing. But when you pull up to Villa Rosa, you've got to still feel like so small and such a piece of shit. You're like, 
oh shit, I have like a place in Marina del Rey and I got these three other little, I got the Palm Springs place, but you pull up to Villa Rosa and I think it's a great reminder. And I would, I would love to ask Lala this of like, because she's like, you know, a boss bitch, man. She's like girl bossin. Does she ever go, what the fuck am I? Like, I look at Villa Rosa and go, what am I? There? You know, like, do you ever have those moments in your life where you're like, well, I know at this age, I'm not going to get to that point ever. Like, I can't even possibly dream of a Villa Rosa. I can't even dream of a hanky or a panky. I can't have swans at this point. And so I wonder if Lala sometimes walks into those places and goes, damn it, what the hell? I mean, what, what are the chances of another send it to Daryl this season? Like, my God, I wonder if also they ever practice catchphrases in the mirror to see if that could work. Like, oh, could this do it? But send it to Daryl was so spur of the moment in an Instagram video that she was pissed. Like, you can't plan genius sayings. You just can't plan that. Because if you said, hey, send it to Daryl, that's pretty catchy. You'd be like, I have no clue what you're fucking talking about. If you don't know the context of that story, it's not a catchy phrase. It's only funny in the context of the situation in Scandal. So anyways, Lisa, of course, you know, Dr. Doolittle, she has like a dog in one hand, dogs are over. You see, you're seeing like, you know, Lisa's secret garden. There's just flowers everywhere. It's overpowering. She's like poison ivy from Batman. The girls walk and she's like, hello, girls. Oh, you haven't met this guy before. This is Donut. Have you met Donut? This is Donut. And she's like, why do you girls have no clothes on? And Lala's like, yo, we're going to a pool party. And little Lala's like, fuck it. Yeah, you can see my cooter. Woo. I'm kidding. She has a wrap around. So we go into Lisa's living room. We see photographs of older dogs that we miss so much. She's like, I'm just finishing up with the flowers. Fresh flowers everywhere. She seats them outside. And this is so fun because I always... I always think of this like when I used to do like silly acting exercises in college. I forgot what method it was. Maybe it was like, was it Meisner? Was it, I don't know, you would have to do a scene, but you would have to have business. Like you'd have to like keep busy. So when a person came in the door, you were like counting pennies, like one penny, two penny, three penny. And so you would be so focused on this activity that whatever anybody said to you, you still were focused on the activity, but you were trying to have a conversation. So it really kind of fed the, the inner life of the scene. And I think that's what's hysterical about Lisa. Like, uh, do you think I should be um, placing flowers in this vase while I have this very serious conversation where I try to convince these women to kiss Sandoval's ass again? Yes. Anyways, he's like, I'm really excited. Really want to talk to you girls about something. So many things. I don't think you're going to like everything I have to say. And Lola's like, what is it about? I spent time with Sandoval and we're in love. No. She's like, I really know for a fact he's in a very dark place. I know that. And she's like, I'm pissed off because I reached out when his friend passed away. I sent a very sweet text. What did he do? He blocked me. He's diving into this villain energy and I'm not here for it. He's need to, he needs to humble himself, have some humility. And I told him to get a good therapist. And I'm talking to that, she's like, my conversation with Sandoval last night, remember outside of the Sir Alley, he's taking no accountability for anything that he's done, she says. So Lisa saying he's depressed. You know what? I haven't seen that. I've just seen him project. Okay. Now, if we ended the scene right there, you'd be like, oh, damn, Sheena, Sheena kind of nailed it. Fina nailed it, right? Like, oh, and you know, potentially Lisa would have been like, those are fascinating points, Sheena. Sometimes you make a great deal of sense. Well, thanks for coming. Have fun at the pool party. But instead, Lisa's like, no, I'm the leader of this. She's like, maybe he's angry, you know, he's upset. Uh, he doesn't know what he's doing. So, and Lola's like, no, he's actually doubling down. What did he say last night? He called her a narcissist. We flash back to the narcissist and he's like, yeah, I know what an narcissist is. That's why Lala won't say she is one. And Lala starts doing the teary Lala. I've messed up a lot of times and I feel like I own it all the time. Yes. You know what? I should have asked more questions about Randall. I'm not stupid. I, I mean, boy, I, I, I haven't helped. And she just starts. She's like, he's going into the press saying Lala needs to be real. She doesn't share her life. She was a mistress. And that's the worst thing he said. Well, they can't acknowledge, Lala says, how they hurt me. But you have to support and love. Your life's going swimmingly. You have the Daryl merch. And talking head, Lisa's like, I look at Tom Sandoval, who's a shadow of his former self. I don't ever want to see 
Anybody go down that path of that kind of depression when you feel the whole world's against you? I've seen depression, ladies. I know he's depressed. I remember, and she brings up her brother about her brother saying that he was depressed and she says it'll always stay with her because it's only so much a person can take before they break. And she's like, I don't want to be in this position where we have regret. And this is a good point, right? And then she's like, I never thought suicide would touch my life in a whisper. And she's like, when I look back, my brother saying he was depressed, that's a real trigger for me because he was depressed. And where is he now? And Sheena's like crying. He's like, oh, Tom Sandoval is not the kind of person uh, said he's had suicidal thoughts unless he means it. And Sheena's like, yeah. And Lala's like, I, uh, I hear what you're saying. I most certainly don't want anybody to wear this for the rest of their life because I know what it's like to continue seeing something. I don't want that. Exactly, my dear girl. Lisa explodes. And you know, Lisa's like, yes, that's it. We've got a show again. You'll hang out with him. Like, this is a very serious conversation. And I'm making light of it, right? She does have this point. You don't want to push somebody to a breaking point. You never know what it is. We've talked about this many times on the show. You have a bad day. You get into a negative thought cycle. You just never know. Wrong place, wrong time. Bad things can happen, right? But there also is this other element that this is a show. And Lisa knows it's a show and we've got to film scenes together. So I do think Lisa, her heart is in the right place, but also her heart is in and with the show at the same time. Now, Lala then goes into a talking head. She's like, I've never given Sandoval's mental health that much of a thought. And I was like, wait a sec. This is the part that confuses me because I'm like, wait a sec. We, we've all given Sandoval's mental health somewhat of a thought, even when I was covered. I mean, like we speculated, we thought, we said, oh my God, what must he be thinking? What must he be feeling? But it is interesting now because of Lisa Vanderpump, now she's going to give it a thought. And the way these girls immediately got talked down by Lisa and are already like, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll forgive him. Like it kind of is just that simple. And I'm like, well, shit, this maybe should have happened a lot sooner. Remember, this is just three months after Scandal broke. So, you know, Lala is like crying kind of, and she's like, I, I've been holding on to a lot of anger. I don't trust anybody and it's just not healthy. I don't want to be angry all the time. I mean, it's truly killing me. Once again, that's dead on. She's right. But the thing is, she does still come off so angry, not just on the show, but at times, like when I saw her at BravoCon defending Sandoval or when I, or even when I watched that dang after show that they just filmed, a, you know, a month or so ago, still so angry coming out at DJ James Kennedy because DJ James Kennedy was kind of like sticking up for Ariana and Lala kind of wasn't having it. And it just goes to show you, we have all colors. We change all different sides, human emotions, you know, go every which way. But sometimes there is this general hypocrisy within this entire cast that is sometimes whip like it's wit you'll give yourself whiplash you're like wait what 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 and then sheena jumps in and she's like they just want to remind you in a very sheena way this hasn't been good for me either he genuinely was one of the best friends i've ever had in my life but doesn't it make it easier to forgive lisa says good point i think sheena's thinking is it worth losing ariana sheena says talk to her about it lisa's like i don't give a fuck <laughs> and then she goes don't be a people pleaser just go where your gut tells you. And to me, that is one of the most evil Disney villain leading things of like, go with your gut, trust your feelings. You know, it's kind of like that, come take a bite of this apple. Yes, Sheena, yes. She leans back with her glass of, you know, Vanderpump Rosé, like, go with your, what's your gut telling you, dear girl? You're such a brilliant young lady. I love Good as Gold, one of my favorite songs. Ken puts it on before we get busy. Before we get busy, can we put on scene as good as gold? So I like to do hip thrusts on you with it. I can't believe that. <laughs> anyway, Sheena's doing that thing that the, the girls do when they put their fingers on their bottom eyelids and trying not to like, she's like, oh, I don't want to ruin my glam. And Sheena reminds us that Ariana made it very clear that she doesn't want to be in a friend group with anybody that is still remaining friends with Tom Sandoval. Uh, basically dead to her. And we flash back to the San, uh, San Scandal episode with Schwartz saying, I won't have mutual friends, you know, with him. So I'm not your friends anymore. Then she is like, but at the same time, if somebody's struggling at this level, how do I keep coming for him? Are you going to Tahoe ladies? And I was like, yeah, I mean, yeah, good. Oh, yes. 
And then she was like, I heard there was a lake house and a boat, so I'm in. <laughs> and then it's like, it's, it's sound of all going. Maybe it would be a good idea if he went. I don't know. I'm just throwing out. I'm just spitballing here. But ladies, let's just stop attacking him. None of us are perfect. Right? And then Lala and Sheena in this lake, they just look like two little kids being talked to. And Lala's like, yeah, right. Like Lala probably went away going, hey, it's our idea to like actually take it easy on Sandoval. But the thing is, I want to remind people what's so funny is that Sandoval is still doing this to himself. Sandoval is still taking shots at Lala. Even Sandoval complaining about Sheena and Lala kind of weaponizing their podcast against him is that Sandoval is still doing the same thing. He just came to it later in the game. Sandoval's doing the same thing. Sandoval's talking as much shit about Lala specifically that I just find it funny of like, you know, I mean, if we're talking about empathy, you know, at the very end of this, Tom is just as angry when he gets a golden opportunity to go try to win back his friend group. You know, it's, it's, that's, the, that's another uh, Vanderpump hypocritical and Vander. What is it? Hypocrite rules. I don't know. Anyways, Ariana and Katie, they pull up to DJ uh, Casa Kennedy's pool party. It's like, welcome. Oh, Oh, yes, yeah, this, this is our place, our humble abode. Sorry, I'm doing Lisa's voice. Anyways, the party's getting started, folks. Lala, Sheena, and Courtney, Sheena's sister pull up. Sheena, by the way, has a bottle of Shmirnoff vodka, which I believe is a product plug, because I think Shmirnoff has a deal with Sheena. She's like, oh, and the DJ, comes, DJ James Kennedy comes out. He's like, guys, no, we've got hot dogs. Yeah, for the grill. Tom Schwartz comes in, like I said, just like a very interesting look, and he... DJ James Kennedy's like, Schwartzy! He's like, uh, uh, I got you a plant. And Allie's like, another plant. I think this is the third plant that Schwartz has gotten us now. I'm going to have to get a gardener, she says in a talking head. I like Allie. Anyways, and then Schwartz goes, oh, I brought a little tequila. I've been on a semi sober curious journey, but today I think I'm going to have a few. <laughs> how do you, hey, by the way, how semi sober curious do you think Schwartz ever got? Do you think it was just that like one night? Well, that's enough for semi-sober curiosity. Time to go back to booze. I'm going to do a quarter of a shot, not a half shot, a quarter. So anyway, Schwartz is like, I've had a strange few days. And talking about it, it's like the conversation last night with Lala, Katie, Ariana didn't go so well. We flash back to that where Lala's like, you should have gotten rid of Tom. I gave up on you a long time ago, Ariana says, and my life is better for it. They tarred and feathered me, dude but I'm Tom Schwartz. I'm not this accessory to the affair. There's so much more to me than that. Okay. Okay. Let's just say what we know. We all like Schwartz, right? Good guy, fun, blast to hang out with, good looking, all that kind of stuff, right? Thank God he didn't do that Bill Clinton imitation again. I do not have sexual relations with that girl. Um, but instead he says, I am not an accessory to this affair. This is where, if I was a producer, I would also lightly troll Schwartz to actually point out to the audience was that ex exactly what he was. He was an accessory to the affair. Just because his heart was in the right place, he was directly an accessory to this affair. I talked about this with Dodie on her podcast, um, but yeah, like he knew about this affair immediately after it happened, the first night. And then he went along with the storyline, even though Katie was his ex and knew it would hurt Katie that he potentially was going to have uh, schnookums and a little hippity dippity with the artist formerly known as Raquel. If that's not an accessory to this affair, and that's the other thing is like Ariana. Yeah, man, those are harsh things to say to Schwartz, but Ariana did consider Tom Schwartz a friend. And I would imagine it's really fucking hurtful and hard to let go when you know that person had information seven months prior and never in any of those seven months, even though they hung out and were around each other, did Schwartz pull her aside and said, you got to talk to Tom. Something's going on. Or, you know, like, you know what I'm saying? That's it. And it sucks. It sucks that Tom Schwartz was even put into that position by Sandoval, but that's why it's really weird in these talking heads for Schwartz because Schwartz should just be like, I fucked up so fucking hard and, and like literally be calling Ariana every day of like, I'm so sorry. I realized what I did. This is what I did. This is what I was feeling. I'm so sorry. I'm a flawed human being. Please forgive me. I want to make this better. But instead he's becoming like, uh, uh, you know, Tom Sandoval Jr. Where his, he, you know, he's becoming a little indignant and throwing out lines of like, you're not the queen of this. You're not the queen of this group. Da, da, da. When it's like, dude, 
you got to actually put yourself fully in her shoes. This is still three months after, right? So that's the thing. What you know, when he has those talking heads, he's got to watch those things because then, I mean, listen, it works. 60% of the audience will probably be like, that's true. He wasn't an accessory to the affair. 40% of the audience will realize, oh, he totally was an accessory to the affair. You know, that's what reality show can sometimes be great because you can actually uh, edit your own storyline. You can be like, I'll throw this out there and see if people bite. And I do wonder if Shorts realizes when he says that stuff that it's kind of filled with a little bit of bullshit. And I'm saying this with saying like, still like the guy, but that's it. Anyways, we have like a little montage of the pool party, a little rap song playing. Uh, they made a little something about her pool float, which is potentially the only something about her that is open right now, unfortunately. And then DJ James Kennedy, like a responsible homeowner, starts jumping off the roof. And he's like, oh, I'm a homeowner. Yeah. And then he convinces Schwartz to do it. And Schwartz jumps off the roof and you can see this DJ James Kennedy. What an addictive personality. You can see the love in his eyes. He's like, yes, Tom Schwartz. He's my new brother that has not done the ultimate betrayal to me. And by the way, I just feel like we were seconds away from like somebody just tanking on the cement. If you listen to this podcast before, this actually triggered me very much because when I was uh, 13 years old, right before I went into high school, I was at a pool party at a family reunion. People were jumping up the top of a pool slide and I was really nervous because I'm a pussy, but they were like, Ryan, do it, do it. And I did it. And it, like, I went in, it was awesome. And then I was like, oh my God. And I got a little cocky, a little confident in myself. And that's why it's always, that's why I'm never cocky or confident because of moments like this. So I went up to do it again, you guys. And I was waving at like a video camera, like, yeah. And they're like, jump, jump. And I'm like, I am, I am. And then my foot slid on the, uh, the pool slide with water and I didn't have my bearing and I just fell instead of jumped and the left side of my body hit the concrete of the side of the pool. And then I passed out and fell into the pool, told the story many times. So I'm sorry if, it, if you're new to this, this, this is crazy. They pulled me out. I passed out and they're like, oh my God, it's going into shock. And all I could think about was, oh, I'm supposed to go to Disneyland the next day with my sister and I really want to go to Disneyland. So I got to walk this off. So I'm like, no, I'm okay. I'm good. I'm good. And uh, they're like, oh shit, wow, I can't believe it. Good, yay, yeah, good man, all right. Like, you're taking that, like, because they literally just watched me crush the left side of my body with cement. And I'm getting up and walking. I remember it so specifically, and the pain just kept increasing and increasing. And they went to the bathroom, I pissed straight blood, really fucking scary, screamed, family came in. Then I, it turned out I had to go to intensive, I was in intensive care for like a week in Burbank, I think it was. And then I entered a new high school in a rib brace because I had um, uh, I bruised my kidney and I cracked three of the ribs on my left side of my body. So when I see Tom Schwartz doing this, I'm just thinking, be be careful, brother, man. At this point, you don't need a want. You don't you can't wear a rib brace into Schwartz and Sandy's business is already not doing well. Right. Anyways, we cut from that pool party. <laughs> Sorry for the little personal story. We're over in Venice. It's different in Venice, you guys. Everybody's grooving, rollerblading. And Tom walks in and we hear, welcome to intimacy. First time here? And he's like, yes. Yeah. And Billy Lee is with him, folks. Billy Lee is back once again. And the lady's like, have you guys done cold plunges before? And Tom's like, I have, dude. And a talking head is like, this whole situation with Scandal and this aftermath, I've been really stressed out, depressed, overwhelmed. And they're like, this is where we'll have your cold plunge room. And, it, you know, it looks like a nice cold plunge room. He says, I realized that I have to be able to handle these emotions in different ways, healthier ways, cold plunge ways, obviously. So he gets in the cold plunge and you guys, Billy Lee, Billy Lee is standing there. <laughs> he gets in the cold plunge. And Billy Lee lights up like a Christmas tree. This is what I'm talking about. She's like, oh, my God. He's getting in the cold water. Oh, my God. She looks so... I'm sorry, Billy Lee, but you looked so titillated in this. You were like, oh, my God. And he's in there. He's getting fully in. And he's like, oh, dude, dude. Oh, 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 oh. oh he's exhaling deeply. Oh, oh, oh. Special Forces, Scandal, let's do this, Rachel. And Billy is like, yeah, yeah. And she leans down next to him and she's like, hey, how intense? One to 10. It's like a nine, dude. And she's just smiling. She's like, oh my God, he said nine. 
And then Stanimal looks directly at her and he goes, it's really intense. And she's just beaming, man. It's like me looking at a Taco Bell menu, just like, woo. And in the talking head, he's like, it feels especially weird right now because Billy Lee is totally staring at me with a weird smile. No, he goes, I've never been an outsider with this group of friends, my group of friends. I, I feel like Andy Dufresne when he first gets to Shawshank and Shawshank Redemption. I wish I could get it back. Just some part that resembles my old life. Anyways, he's still in the cold plunge and he's like, he ducks under and Billy Lee goes, oh, oh my God. Like th- I'm vocalizing because her, I can't do, but her mouth is just like, oh my God, I've never seen a man duck his head under cold water. Oh my God. He is in, Tom Sandoval is back. Oh, it's a baptism in this cold plunge. And then Tom, <laughs> Because it always seems like the people that you love the most, they seem to hurt you the most. Okay, now let's stop as a family, talk about this. Uh, ridiculous, right? Because he doesn't realize that, yeah, man, that's why Ariana was really fucking hurt about what you did. Like the closest people hurt you. Yes, Tom. Yes, you're finally getting it. But hopefully you can actually get your worldview out there past yourself and your own ego and realize the hurt you caused other people that you were so close to. Now, this is the other thing. I'm like, I just wish I could get my friend that group that I've never been on the outside of this group. What part of this group is left? What part you like you badmouth Lala right and left. You want to be her bestie, which by the way, we'll see, have to see him kiss her ass for the rest of the season and then badmouth her under her, her, his breath or something. Anyways, Tom has his head in the water and he comes up. So his hair is perfect. And you almost like, I almost thought knowing Tom a little bit of like, can you guys get like a tight shot of me with the water coming off my long luscious locks? And it's like, cause he looks good, right? He, I bet all you freaks out there are like, oh my God, he's, I hate him, but he's hot. And Billy Lee, there's like a side shot where once again, she's like, oh my God. Oh my God. I have never, like I've, I've been in water with people before. I've never had any kind of look of amazement. It's always been horror. And he just, it's like thirst trapping. Anyways, we go back to the pool party um, Allie and Lala talk about wanting to get a potentially a BBL and Allie's like, no, let's just do 50 squats a day and like, let's keep each other on that program. And at the end of the summer, we'll have a big butt or you could just start podcasting Allie. That's going to give you a big old ass. Anyways, Lala goes, Hey, how, how is drinking going with James? And Allie's like, I don't think he's drank for three months. And Lola's like, that's pretty good. Cause the first 30 days are pretty freaking hard. And then we cut back out to DJ James Kennedy and he's like, Schwartz, look at this. It's weed. Look at these cans of drinkable weed. And Schwartz is like, oh my God, dude, that's dangerous. Have you ever had one of those weed drinks? Those weed drinks will fuck you up. Like, I'm glad DJ Dan Kennedy is sober from alcohol. And I guess this is what he needs to like keep, you know, and I, 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 weed is weed. But like, we do eventually see DJ James Kennedy chugging these. He's like, look at me, guys, night. And Schwartz is like, you're insane, man. But it is funny because they keep going back and forth from this deep conversation with Lala and Ali about James sobriety. And then we go seeing him chug this. And it did harken back to that scene for me with DJ James Kennedy. When Remember when he was chugging the fireball? He's like, I want to chug the fireball, you know, like five seasons ago or something. And I just thought, oh, we've grown up so much, but not fully yet. We are now chugging intense weed drinks. <laughs> Anyways, Ali says, I'm not going to share his story about why he got sober, but you can ask him, you know, and you know, she's like, yeah, you can try to, to ask him about it. And Lala's like, everyone has a rock bottom moment, you know, that this is no longer working and a talking head. She's like, there's something about a rock bottom moment that changes everything. And we flash back to her rock bottom bottom moment where she was like, I hung out with Randall. No, that wasn't it. She said, I went to uh, Disney World with Randall and his family, and I was drunk four days straight. I get on the plane. I'm face chugging out of a bottle. And the next morning I woke up and said, I will never live this way again. And I reached out and got help. In this talking about, she says, it's a hard path in this talking head. I've got a lot of work to do, even sober. You do, Lola. Anyways, 
Lala reminds Allie, me and James have been through a lot of ups and downs, but I don't want to trigger him by asking a question where it's a little too deep. So I don't know if I'm able to even ask him this question because sobriety is something that I'm obviously, and Allie's like, no, I think you should ask him about it. But this is the other thing because it is a very serious issue for DJ James Kennedy. But this is the other thing why I suggest that we do have a therapist on set at all times. Are we asking these people in the right way? Are we facilitating a correct discussion or are we just potentially making things worse and profiting off of pain, you know, which is, by the way, I'm all good with that. That's reality television. This is what you kind of sign up for. But after we've seen these people for so many years, you just want to make sure, by the way, also I get tr so triggered at pool parties because I just think of Sheena's, uh, those pool parties back in the day when uh, she was with Mike Shea and he was trying to be sober. Do you remember those? Anyways, uh, you know, DJ James Kennedy's out there. He's like, let's go, baby. Just chugging. And then there's a fire on the new grill. Like, and everybody's like, James, you've got a fire going on. He's like, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh, that'd be great. He burns his place down the first month. Like the planes overhead are seeing the flames. Um, he's like, These, it's fucking angry. I'm facing the fire of my new grill. Oh, and I just chugged a weed drink. Thank God there was no fire at Casa Kennedy. Anyways, we see the corn, the dogs. Everybody's like, it smells so good over here. We see DJ James Kennedy on the ones and twos. And now Lala and Schwartz goes, Schwartzy, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to swim and you're going to lift this pool inflatable over my head. And he's like, yeah, okay, yeah. Lala sits up. And so they're going to have a conversation now. And Lala's like, I know I came pretty heavy last night. And Schwartz is like, Schwartz, classics. This is a great Schwartz movie. He's like, no, it's okay. It's okay, dude. No, no. And she's like, listen, I'm still working. Like I'm not getting triggered, you know, by your own experiences, but it's going to be a process. That's beautiful. No, I love that. But Lala says, I'm just tired of keeping my dukes up. I can't go from machetes or crying in the fetal position. I've got to, there's got to be. He's like, mm, yeah, I appreciate you acknowledging that. And again, I know like we all have problems, dude, but there was a moment last night, Ariana looked at me like I was subhuman, which by the way, Ariana actually, didn't she introduce the word subhuman again in last year's episodes of uh, Vanderpump Rules? Anyways, now it, Schwartz is like, she was looking at me like I'm, I was subhuman, dude. Like, and she's got this kind of um, queen status and um, for a second. And Lala's like, like put on a pedestal. Yeah. Like diva energy, as opposed to energy of somebody who's been hurt. I do love Ariana. No, I'm not going to fawn for her affection or validation, but that was triggering. And Lala's like, of course, that's a natural reaction. Actually, I thought you handled yourself quite well last night, Schwartz. He's like, really? Of course, I was triggered when you talked about her ego because I immediately took that as you talked about my ego, which, by the way, is hysterical because it just shows you how fucked up all of these people's egos right now that Lala openly admits of, oh, yeah, you mentioned that thing about Ariana's ego. I wasn't offended for Ariana. I was offended because of my ego. And Schwartz is just loving that Lala is confiding him. By the way, Schwartz is giving off very, like, ecstasy Molly vibes here. He's like, oh, that's amazing. Oh, I love it. Feel the grass. Oh, my God. Feel the rain on your face, you know? Anyways, Lala's like, so I kind of take... There are times when I take things to heart, which is what I'm working on, not being a dog in everyone else's fights. I used to think that it was my superpower, she says in a talking head, that I could call anybody on their shit. Like, I've seen this before. I got your number. And it's just not healthy. At some point in my life, I have to practice forgiveness. <laughs> I cannot wear my trauma like a badge of honor anymore. He's like, yeah, yeah. She goes, I didn't mean to come across as I think you should abandon Tom. By the way, this is another editor troll. We should have literally gone back to that moment of like, you need to fucking get rid of him. And I do want to point out, I never said that they should abandon each other. No, they belong together, even though it's just wild. And I think they will always be together. I have no problem with that. But I do love how Lala backtracks. Like, I, I never meant that you guys shouldn't be together when she literally said, you need to get the fuck away from him. Anyways, Lala goes, I constantly watch you please everyone around you. And it's such like an amazing quality, but it's like how my dad was. Like everyone loved him and it made me cry, Short says. And people bulldoze over my dad and like the stress of it all, like I truly believe killed my dad. Yeah. And I just, I want you at some point to say like, 
I can do things. I can do two things at once. Yeah. I can be down for you and I can going to have your back, but like also do what's best for me. I mean, your brother's going through shit, going through the fight of his life. Yeah. Your dad. Yeah. And I'm sorry if I did not give you grace last year for what you were going through. Um, and we flash back to those scenes from the beach episode where, you know, Schwartz is like, you're angry and you're bitter. You're a bootleg housewife. You're, and she's like, you're the epitome of a fucking loser. And like, look at those lips. They're disgusting. Schwartz goes, I'm sorry about coming for your lips. And you're the most beautiful woman that I've ever laid eyes on. I mean that platonically, but like when we're mad at each other, when you don't communicate to be like, fuck her, fuck Lala, look at her, look at her lips that she just got done. But then I see you with ocean and I see what a great fucking mom you are and how much humanity you have. And I remember kind of why I fell in love with you in the first place. That's friends, dude. And Lala's like, I got you. I don't know when you ever sit down with Tom. If you could just, you're doing like the way you're joking. It's so beautiful and heartfelt. Maybe give him a little something. Yeah, I know. I fucking get it. He's family. Tom's family. Lala goes, I know. I cannot abandon that man. And I won't. I won't. Pointing out the obvious once again. Beautiful sentiment, right? Like going hard in the paint for his boy, Tom. I wish he could have done half of this for Katie. And do not come at me with like Katie this, Katie that. Literally, this is how hard he rides for Tom. That he's literally pulling like people aside like Iago and be like, could you just little, could you give him a little taste of that love? Your fun humor. Oh, you're so beautiful with Ocean. And I think he actually genuinely does mean those things, but it does serve a purpose to actually get this gang back, the, the fun old gang back together. And Lala's like, I, Lala doesn't even challenge it. Lala isn't like, listen, Schwartz, I love you. I do. And I've told you many times that I'm never going to talk to you again, but here we are. I can talk to you. You, you know, you got a good sense of humor. You, you know, you understand you have empathy for people. I get it. Tom is not at that place yet. So I do got to keep him at a distance because it is triggering for me because of people like Randall. And I hope you understand that I won't be mean to Tom, but I don't want to be buddy, buddy with him. And I hope you can understand that. But of course we can't have those conversations because that means show's over, right? We see a plane overhead. It crashes. No, it doesn't. We just see the plane overhead. We come back. We're at the cold plunge place. Tom is all in his robe. And he's like, oh my gosh, dude, I feel great, dude. Billy's like, you deserve it. You do. That's been something that I uh, have not really fed to myself in a while. Yeah. Thank you, Billy. Yeah, just know that you are worthy and you deserve bliss. Huh? The fuck? Are you like thinking about dating, Billy says? I'm not doing that, dude. I do really miss Raquel, though. I do. You haven't talked to her? No, dude. It's been like at least three weeks. Wow. The last time I talked to Raquel, he says in a talking head, I didn't think it was going to be the last time I spoke to her. And we flash back to him in his room 27 days earlier. I love you. And I'll be gone for the next um, 10 days or so. I guess for special forces. I'll, um, I'll see you when I get back, dude. I mean, in that conversation, she did tell me she was extending her again, her stay at the facility. I told her I loved her and, you know, that we would talk later. What we had was definitely love, he tells Billy. That's why I was so addicted to it. That's why I couldn't see anything else. It's not like we were just hanging out having sex. The hanging out was like the best fucking part, dude. I'm hoping that we can at least give whatever this is some sort of shot. <laughs> If it wasn't for those pesky fucking therapists, no, she he, he continues in his talking head. Pretty much, I'm like, um, I'm saving myself for Raquel. What a good man, dude. Billy goes, I feel like the fucking world is hating on you so much. I'm just tired of it. I just wish people could see you do a cold plunge. No, how much you were hurting to know that. Because there were times where I was like, literally thought we could have lost you. I got close a couple of times, he says. When you get in that frame of mind, I had to like really snap myself out of it. He says, and Billy's just shaking her head. Yes, yes, yes. There's all kinds of feelings in his head, pain, anger, sadness, depression, bleakness, all of those things, right? Very real, I would imagine. He says, I lost all of my friends and I felt like maybe the best way to show that I'm sorry and kind of, feel like what everybody wants is for me to go away. And he says, I just want to be happy again. I don't feel like I'm allowed. You'll get there. Billy Lee says we bought a 10 pack at this cold plunge place. You'll get there. No. Okay. A couple of things about that. First off, 
it's very, you know, like, listen, the fact that they have little footage of Tom on the phone with Raquel going like, I'm off, dude. Um, you know, this boo hoo, woe is me. It was love. It wasn't just fucking, it was hanging out. It's like, that was the best part, the fucking hanging out. Like I, I mean, that is wild. And the fact that Rachel on her podcast, which is, you know, communicating spades better than Tom ever can, which I never thought I would say about Raquel ever in my life. Um, is explaining this and is explaining the toxicity of this relationship. And the fact that you're like, I was addicted to that, that just shows you that's not love, man. It might be obsession, but it's not love. You're addicted to that. But also, yeah, this isn't noble like you think it's coming off. And I think he is miscalculating how this would actually come off. And, you know, he does still have a lot of his friends. It's just not, I guess, maybe us as friends, you know, like us, the greater good. And we're a bunch of batshit people ourselves, but he does still have a lot. But I know when you get into that thought process, you do feel like you have nobody, but that whole, like, you know, people just wanted me to go away. Tom, nobody wanted you to go away, like harm yourself, go away. There is a potential that people want you to go away or think it might be the best for you to go away from TV for a bit. But I don't mean that as like a never again, grace TV, like fuck, but like, you know, there's tons of people that I don't like on TV all the time, but like, maybe it would be, I'm trying to say this like as kindly as possible. It would be good for you to take some time for yourself to actually get away from the, the, these kind of thoughts, you know, is that's the kind of go away that I always meant is like, get your brain right again about how the world actually works and start making amends that aren't making amends on TV amends. You know what I'm saying? So anyways, we have this heavy situation. Billy Lee's going to stand by him. We, uh, see a pool again. And DJ James Kennedy's like, I'm butter Bay, you know, salt Bay. I'm pouring butter on corn on the corpse. Look at me. I'm butter Bay. He's obviously high out of his gourd. Anyways, Sheena's like, uh, yeah, I, I, t I went over to Lisa, talked about Sandoval, talked about, oh no, she said talking about talking to Tom in the Sir Alley way about being upset at the podcast. Sheena's like, here's where I'm struggling. We went over to Lisa's and I was like, okay, me and Lala, we went. She was very emotional because she said she's seen a lot of similarities with her brother and Ariana's hearing this and like, okay, she's very concerned about Tom and she's asked us just to ease up. And Ariana's like, Tom and her brother are very different people. I'm sorry, but no, I'm not. No, he will not take responsibility for what he did. Ariana says, so ease up. What am I? I'm not going to be like, Hey everybody, it's me, Ariana on my Instagram story. Uh, if you guys could just like be nice to my ex-boyfriend, like he literally did all these, that's not going to happen. And I'm talking to that. She's like, I can understand he has had some feelings and thoughts but those thoughts and those feelings are based on the situation that he created in which he didn't give a fuck about anybody else's mental health. I know I'm a bitch saying this, but like, it just feels a little bit like annoying. And this is another place where I'm like, oh, she's going to get dinged for this. But like, actually take a second to think about what she's saying. She's right. Also, she was the person that this was done to. So now all of a sudden we've got to give a greater grace than we ever gave to Ariana. And I don't consider getting brand deals grace. I don't consider that. But also, this was a situation that he created. Ariana is not going to go on there and be, hey, be nice to my ex-boyfriend who cheated on me for seven months. Um, you know, that's the other thing. And the other thing about mental health, and she talked about this on the after show, is that, dude, Tom went on Howie Mandel's podcast and fucking like made a bad joke about her potentially killing herself. Like, you know... <laughs> This is when the fact that Ariana is still standing and like keeping her head held up high is that's something to pay attention to. If anything, Tom should be looking at her as an example of how to walk through fire, of how to actually stand up for yourself, to try to believe in yourself when the light is kind of dissipated everywhere and there just feels like there's darkness. And I got to tell you, you know this already, but just to remind you, just because you're on TV or Dancing with the Stars or your bank account is getting bigger than it has before, that doesn't at the end of the day mean shit. When you are in bed at night by yourself with your thoughts or even around people with your thoughts, it's a different story. We all know this, but I think we are almost sometimes like, brainwashed by the TV waves or some shit where we're like, we forget these things. 
Now, grace can be given to many people. We can give Tom Sandoval grace, but we do have to remember that he did all of these things to Ariana that he's complaining about for himself. And Ariana never begged anybody else to give her grace. She goes, he was such an amazing friend to me. And Ariana's like, it wasn't genuine. As soon as he's getting invited to parties again, it'll be like, great, that's what I wanted. This is a scary fucking person and I don't trust any word that comes out of his mouth because it's constantly changing and it feels like manipulation. But Ariana at the end of the day knows that all these girls are going to make their own decisions and she lets them. She's going to let them. She's going to watch it. It'll probably be painful to her. Will she say anything? We'll see. But it is manipulation. She has been through this, right? Potentially part of it is a manipulation because at the end of the day, that's what Tom wants. He just wants to go to parties again. And that's good. Actually, you know, that's where he finds bliss. And he'll he's getting back to that place. Anyways, the next day, Schwartz is once again on his workout regime. He's coughing on a Peloton machine. We're at Lala's apartment. And this is, we have a scene with DJ James Kennedy. He comes over to her apartment uh, or her condo. And he's like, hello. Hi, Lily, the dog. Hi, Jameson. I'm upstairs. Hi, Jameson. Little Lala screams. I've never been up here. It's cool up here. Yeah. And they do their greetings. We see a picture of uh, Kent, Lala's dad. It's very actually cool to see. Uh, he has, uh, she has a baby bottle. He's like, is that your bottle or oceans? And we flash back to Lala in 2017 going, I turn on my favorite show. I prop the baby bottle up like this and I just suck. And Sheena watching her going like, cool, very cool. Anyways, they're going to have a serious discussion. So I'm excited to see what comes out of this. They talk about Perrier. I don't know. Anyway, she goes, hey, what made you want to get sober? You don't have to tell me. What do you mean I don't have to tell you, Lala? Okay, here's the deal. I'll tell you in confidence. But like, obviously, which is so funny when somebody says, I'll tell you in confidence when a camera's on them. Basically, when Tom and Raquel's stuff happened, a lot of emotions were flowing, right? Right? Ali and I were fighting a lot, especially when I was getting like drunk, you know, basically. What does it start with? Comments on Instagram. Was it about Tom and Raquel? Was it about my showing too much emotion about Tom and Raquel? And then she went and stayed at a friend's house for like, and I was like, oh, it was a big argument. Yeah, I came home and the cats were gone. How long did she stay at the friend's house? Just two nights, two nights. Took the cats and I came home and I was so upset because it was like empty and it wasn't the energy that it was before. In a... Talking head, he's like, last time I quit, it was definitely for the relationship. We flash back to Raquel saying, hey, if you can't get your shit together, we, if you can't get together, your shit will, will break up. And he's like, we, we broke up. I'm single again. I can drink. But this time I'm doing it for myself. And because I'm doing it for myself, it will better my life, my relationship, better my job, better my DJing career. I've seen those benefits before, and I definitely want to see them again. Um, she tells Lala, I was willing in that moment to do anything to get her back. And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to drink anymore. And this is basically the deal. And I was like, damn. Now, the confusing part of this, and I want to say this very gently, but it's kind of like hypocrite rules. Um, Vanderpump hypocrite. I totally support DJ James Kennedy's sobriety journey. I think that's amazing. He really is, no matter you know all of these things that we hear about him, he is so, it's not even just entertaining. He does know how to light up a screen uh, you know, he is a fun DJ. Oh, I'm trying to say positive things. He does make me laugh. Um, but he's saying the first time he did it was for Raquel, but this time he's doing it for himself. But in that same thing, he's like, I told La Ali, you know, I would do anything to get her back. I told her I would could drink. It sounds like once again, you're doing it for somebody else, even though you know that it provides all these benefits for you in all of these other avenues. But at the same time, it feels like you're still you know what I'm saying? Or maybe just in that moment, that's how it came off and how he, the words he chose to use. But I just thought, oh man, it's sad because that's what it, it sounded like. And also think about that. Ali, uh, Ali kept that secret. That didn't get leaked to any of us yahoos. We didn't know that. Like Ali really kept that close to the best. She really does care about him. Anyways, he's like, I'm 31 now. I want to focus on health. I don't want to be like an alcoholic 40 year old that loses everything, you know? You could have just said Tom Sandoval. And Lala's like, I just want to know you to know that you have someone in me to support you and I will not share what we talk about. Do we believe that? And DJ James Kennedy's like, listen, uh, you know, uh, and Lala's like, no, nobody else can relate to this. 
in a talking head, she's like, I will never have another relationship in my life that I will have with James. We went from two kids being complete and utter train wrecks. And they were, and we see flashbacks of that when they were at that one premiere in 2016. And she's like, uh, nobody, uh, I see here. Nobody here has been working on their summer bodies to Katie. Remember that was fucking asshole. And then we've been through relationships that have ended sobriety journeys. It's just hard to find someone like that, that you're kind of bonded with for life. And Lala goes, I make time for people that I love. And Lala's like, we're always going to be a hundred. And little Lala's like, for real, dude, a hundred, bro. Yeah. Little Lala. Anyways, we end that scene. But, I, you know, sometimes you do think, man, DJ James Kennedy and Lala, it would be interesting to see a sober relationship between the two. Like, I think Allie and him are fine, you know, like, but I'm saying like the mind does wonder what two sober people that are that connected, what that relationship would be with. Also, when that Schwartz pool scene happened, didn't you think even though Schwartz was like, you're the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. Totally platonic though, for real. Like there was like an inkling there of like, are they going to kiss? Like, that's why I was like, it was very, it was very ecstasy Molly vibes for me of like, what's going on here? Like, is this a potential way to keep the show going? But damn poor Katie. Like, and I wonder what Katie thought watching that fucking scene being taking place in the corner of the pool. And Katie, Katie just must be so over all of this. Okay. So we're back in Valley village folks. We're over at Tom Schwartz's apartment and we hear a clipper, uh, clipper buzzing. We get on the, 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 the fridge and we see little post-it notes. One says, dear buck, I love you so much. Thank you for everything. I will miss you. Love Dukes. Um, so we see those little post-its that are, uh, in the clear shot. And we hear this lady go, head straight, stop moving. And we see it's Joe, you guys, Tom Schwartz's friend. And Joe is, um, Joe is a human being, Schwartz says, that I, um, Joe is uh, a human being. Joe is a light in my life. We cut back to one year earlier. My friend Joe's staying with me. And Sheena's like, is Joe? Uh, and we hear all this, like, have you hooked up with Joe? And he's like, not even a little bit. And then... Then Schwartz says to Joe, who is cutting Schwartz's hair, oh, the world thinks you're like my secret roommate girlfriend. And Joe goes, ha! And then he's like, I mean, we did spend a lot of time last summer, so I get the optics. And Joe goes, well, we still do. And he and talking to him, he goes, Joe was never living with me. Was she staying with me sporadically? Yes. She's not my girlfriend. She never was. We had like a whirlwind romance, but um, we're just buds now. Um. Schwartz is so damn charming, you guys. Like, there definitely was this pseudo relationship with them. Like, I mean, that's not the full truth of it either. And I think the thing with reality shows that we've got to start really drilling into our brains is that they're not going to tell us the truth, nor is it our job to uncover the actual truth. Like, the show is going to show us what it shows. And we usually have a good sense of it anyways. Like, yeah, there was something going on. It was weird. He didn't want to share it. It probably got weird with them. They remained friends. Who knows? Maybe they do a little slap and tickle still. I don't know. But the fact that Joe wants to be on camera now, like when the, the chips are down for Sandoval and Schwartz to show the world that these guys are great is wild. Uh, also, I want to remind people, Joe is the person that Katie said has crackhead energy. This used to be Kristen Doty's really good friend. We talked about it on Kristen Doty's podcast. This was must have been wild for Kristen to watch. So anyways, there's a knock at the door and the dogs are barking because they feel a dark energy and it's Tom Sandoval. What up, dude? What are you guys doing, dude? Oh, and Joe's like a little trimmer. Nice, dude. All right. She picks Schwartz up off the floor where she was cutting his hair. And uh, how's it going, man? Good to see you, dude. You all right? Yeah. And then Tom sees some hair on the floor and he's like, is this your pubes, dude? And he's like, yeah. Uh, so a pube joke about Tom's cut hair or cut hair. Very funny. So they uh, have Joe sweep it up like a barber. And Schwartz is like, I was getting the dogs groomed at Vanderpump rules. I had a Vanderpump dogs. I had a, a, a great conversation with Lisa um, Tahoe. Um, so I think you should like, I go with us. I booked a sick ass cabin. and I want to invite you, dude. Yeah. Ariana and Katie aren't going to be there. Um, the girls are going to be like Lala, James, Brock, Sheena. I felt like it could be good neutral ground. Like it might be a good opportunity for you to have some good one-on-ones with people, you know? Maybe you leave your ego here. Maybe you can just be like, dude, I'm sorry that I hurt you. 
And I will say, like, this is a good friend, right? It is. And he's really looking out for Tom. I will. I do find it funny that in the corner you see Joe, like, talking about all the people that are going to be there. And she's like, you going to invite me? You going to invite me? What's going on? And never names Joe. And so this is a golden opportunity for somebody that just cried at a cold plunge saying that he misses all of his friends. He's never been on the outside of his friend group. He just wants to get that back. So this is the opportunity to get that back. So you know the next lines out of his mouth are going to be like, dude, thank you so much for putting yourself so out there. I am going to leave my ego so at home. You're not going to even know that I have an ego and I'm going to make up with everybody. But instead, this is what he says. Lala, I'm like, sorry, I gave you like um, so much fucking content for your podcast. I'm sorry, too, about all that merch you sold. And Joe's like, yeah, yeah. For them to not understand what they did is so fucking fucked up. Lala and Sheena showed the entire nation how to treat us, except for Ariana's Lyft driver. We cut to Lala's podcast. Sandoval's always given me a narcissist vibe. Sheena's podcast. It's making me question the last 13 years of friendship with Sandoval. People followed their lead, dude. And Schwartz is like, Tom, uh, this energy is not going to serve you well. You got to put down the guard a little bit, dude. I'm not saying you have to let people walk all over you and abuse you, but like, can you like bring it down? He's using the David Schwimmer friend's hand motion. His tone of, they don't know what he, they've done to me. It worries me. I don't want to undermine his feelings, he says in a talking head, but I don't think it's going to be productive. You know, at first I was like, Tom, maybe I should use this as like a bond building exercise. Just invite the gang. I miss our old chemistry. Like, but then I was like, fuck that. I'm bringing Tom. Listen, I'm optimistic about this trip to Tahoe, dude. But do I expect to miraculously cleanse everyone's memory? No, of course not. In a talking head, he says, but I'm hoping maybe it just opens up the door a little bit. I think Lala has been softening up in a lot of ways in life, growing and maturing, but it's something cosmically happened yesterday. This dude was definitely on drugs. Something cosmically changed yesterday. I don't know how to explain it. She was like fully self-aware Lala. I've never seen her like this. And Jojo's that's great. That is great. No, that's finally great. I'm not saying let him walk all over you, Tom, but like feel the, let him feel those feelings for a couple minutes. Like, and Jojo keeps Joe trying to like butt in. And Sandoval goes, it's been five months. And Schwartz very smartly and wisely says, what's another five minutes, dude? And you can hear Tom potentially is thinking about what Tom Schwartz just said, or he's thinking about some karaoke song. Who knows? Um, I think people are in a place where they're ready to talk without necessarily coming after you, dude. Huh? Just think about it. Joe goes, uh-huh. Sandoval's like, yeah. Yeah. And then Schwartz goes, rah, and Joe goes, rah, and they make like weird friend sounds, completely platonic friend sounds. Um, and I do want to just say though, Sheena and Lala, even though very powerful podcasters, um, they did not give us the roadmap. They did not show us what to do. In no way did they show us what to do. And if you, Tom, if you truly listen, like we were like talking about everybody. We were talking about Lala. We were talking about like everybody, not just you, man. They did not show the world, but also they do have the authority to tell their own stories and their own take on this. And people did want to hear, <clears throat> people did want to hear it. Sorry, I just started choking on my own bullshit. No, people did want to hear it. So yeah, they have every right to say whatever they want. Like Sheena's little clip was, I'm starting to question my 13 years of friendship. It's all right to say those things. In Sheena's mind, she was actually questioning her 13 years of friendship. I don't know where, I don't know. That's the part where like Santa will be like, it's hurtful. Yeah. I'm, I'm so bummed that I made her feel this way. Okay. So now we're at Sheena and Brock's and we get another scene with Tori, which is summer moon's new nanny. Hey, we're going to see Tori again. Tori has summer moon picking him up and Tori looks so damn young. She really does. Uh, they're doing a little cute little games with summer moon. And they have like little toys and Tori's like, Summer Moon, do you do a Zempic shots? And Brock's like, it's a bad conversation to have around my kid. Come on. What are you talking about there, mate? Come on. It's a fun game to play with kids. Have you gotten your own Zempic shots? Anyways, Sheena is uh, potentially going to go out. She has dinner plans with James and Allie. And as much as I trust Tori, she says, the anxiety of leaving Summer with someone outside of her mom, with her mom, is a hard pill to swallow. So she also has Courtney, Sheena's sister. Courtney, I don't know if Courtney is being kind of like 
ushered potentially in as a little side character in the cast as well. But the darkness of it all is Tori. Um, I did say that when I saw Sheena at the crappies, we had, we actually had a long conversation and I did say, yo, Tori, how set up is that? Was this really? And Sheena swears up and down. No, this was really my nanny. I had nothing to do with the Tom and Katie. That was not a planned plot at all. So she like, cause I was like, how, like, come on, am I really supposed to believe this? And she was like, no, totally, totally. So anyways, this is uh so they can go. Anyways, we're at this dinner and Allie and I talking heads like, listen, you know, Tom Sandoval's always been nice to me, but I feel really uneasy being around him, just seeing the way that he hurt James, which is kind of interesting. But she says, I don't want to fake be nice, like good to see you. It's just one of those things where you're like uh, preparing for the awkwardness, which is what you would feel. But I do think it is interesting that Ali is not saying because of how he treated Ariana, because of how he treated DJ James Kennedy, because DJ James Kennedy is obviously you know, the ultimate betrayal of Tom Sandoval is to him. And Ali is being a good girlfriend and going like, that's why it would be awkward for me. Anyways, so they are texting uh, about is Tom Sandoval actually going to be there? And Brock's like, listen, if he's going to be there, there's hotels down the street if we need one. And DJ James is like, I'm I'm not stressing out about it. He's Schwartz's friends. We can hang. And if it meshes at one point, then, you know, we'll, we'll hang. And Brock's like, there's right and there's wrong. We're not picking sides. What you did was very wrong, Tom. And he needs to acknowledge that. So none of us are choosing Team Ariana. We're at a point now, you know, like we're on the side. And I was like, yeah, we can have empathy for someone who's fucked their whole life up. And James is like, right. And, and Brock's like, it could get dark and messy real quick. It really could. <laughs> okay, so we pick up because DJ James Kennedy, this is the last scene, is going over to Vanderpump Dogs. We're really promoting Vanderpump Dogs, which, by the way, I feel like Sandoval should potentially be staying at Vanderpump Dogs. We have a rescue. Anyways, we see Summer, the director of marketing that we met, uh, was it last episode or the episode before? She's getting a couple lines this season. And we see Lisa. This is such a bullshit scene. Lisa, well, not the James part, but Lisa's like, are we sure it's him? We don't know what she's talking about. Are we sure it's him? And Summer's like, a thousand percent. So obviously after watching this, you know, when, when Graham Cracker gets reintroduced, that's what Lisa's saying. Are we sure it's Graham? Lisa knows damn well at this point that it's grand. This is such a fake fucking in entrance to this scene. Anyways, DJ James Kennedy comes strolling in, thinks he's going to talk about Tom Sandoval. He's like, hello, hello. Hi. Uh, hello. So they do their pleasantries. And uh, he's like, uh, listen, dear boy. Um... Yeah, I need you to sit. Um, listen. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, you're 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 worried about Graham. Yeah, yeah. And we flash back to him talking about Graham two weeks earlier to Lisa. Where's the dog? I hope he's good. I don't know. And all of a sudden, we see Graham walk down the steps, and he goes, "Is that Graham? <gasps> Graham, the guy's night, dog's night." James, he's been rescued. What? And DJ James Kennedy starts crying immediately. And I got to tell you, I cried. We all cried. It's very emotional. It really is. And it makes you think about your dog and dogs. That, it makes me think about Brooklyn who passed away. The second I touch him, I can see it's him. He's doing the same little wiggle. He tried to bite Lisa's hand off. I know it's him now. I got a call, James, from someone that says this dog has been in a foster home for two months. What? And he's bitten a couple of times, so I'm dropping off at the shelter. So somebody said to us, what, would we take him? And James is still crying, and Graham is just walking around. <sighs> he's like a little boy. I'm feeling anger, sad, I'm feeling confused. He cries in the talking head a little bit. We're back in the scene. He's my best friend. And it's like literally a fucking dream come true that he's back with me. And I just don't know. I just don't know. It's fucking possible. I really don't. I was not expecting that shit, Lisa. What the hell? I was expecting to talk about fucking Tom and a cold plunge today. What the fuck? Guys, no. Thank you so much, Lisa. I don't know what to say. I just kind of think of him sometimes like he's in a good place. 
He belongs with you, dear boy. Ah, do you want to take him? Yes, I do. My first thought's Ali, you know, and having to make this work, but I think there's a reason, like, this is happening, and, like, this is meant to be. Of course, every time I see a golden doodle, the most popular fucking dog in Los Angeles, you know, walking down the street, I think of Graham, he says in a talking head. I think of every good time we used to have and then shake it off and you go back to your day. And now to be able to like hold him and hug him and train him to bite others again, you know, it's just, it was Graham's destiny to make his way back to me, to his true home in Burbank. Thank you again, Lisa. Thank you. Love you. Love you. Love you. And... All right, Graham, we're off. Here we go. And we he just takes Graham out of Vanderpump Dogs. Like, just takes him. And we see them walk off. Let's go, Graham. Let's go. Me and you again, Graham Cracker. He changes the dog's name to Hippie, which, by the way, is his godfather, if you don't know, is George Michael, one of my favorite musicians of all time. He had a dog named Hippie. Now, yeah, George Michael is DJ James Kennedy's godfather. DJ James Kennedy's dad used to work with George Michael. God, I love George Michael. Rest in peace, dude. I love that man so much. Anyways, um, so he renames Graham Cracker Hippie. You know, so we'll find that on the next episode. I was under the impression that Graham Cracker was reunited with James in uh, the the Lake Tahoe trip. That's what I always thought when all of this information was coming out uh, when they were filming. Like, so this was so it was surprising. That this was a Vanderpump Dogs. My the other thing was, I, I just thought, man, this is so brutal if they really did it kind of manipulative if they really did do this to James, like it's so emotional. And also part of me thinks he must have been primed for it in some way, because how would you just walk out? Like, where's the dog food? Where like, you're just going to like, you know, not have a bag of stuff to take with. Like there were just little things about that. But at the same time, it pulled at your heartstrings so much. Now, listen, there is another side of the story. And of course, it's Rachel's Raquel's. And she did talk about this on the first episode of her podcast, which I did a recap of, I think on my Patreon, or maybe it was on here. I'm not sure. Uh, but I listened to the whole thing and it really fills in a lot of the blanks and why she did. I'm not excusing any of her behavior, but it fills in a lot of the blanks and why she really felt really um, not good about this dog going back to DJ James Kennedy. I don't know, man. He seems like he really loves that dog. Hopefully everything's great. We see in the next episode, he's the dog's already going for Allie's cats. Who knows? And the thing is, you know, Allie does keep things pretty close to the vest. Um, and she's, you know, we, we didn't even realize she left for a weekend away from DJ James Kennedy, but it really did tug on your heartstrings. But I did think DJ James Kennedy said, if we were going to take something positive out, out of this, he did say that thing of like, you know, sometimes I'll be walking down the street. I'll have a thought of Graham, you know, and think about all the good times and then I'll have to shake it off. And I thought that was such a great thought about how we go through life and how we sometimes deal with loss. Um, I was talking with Sandra, who I work with, or we were texting with me and Meditza, and she was talking about her grandma and grandfather and her grandma had been, you know, uh, has been, you know, gone for a while now. And, you know, it was having memories about her. And I thought, you know, and still feeling pain and sadness from it. And of course, joy thinking about all the memories, but that's what it is, is that these people and these animals and everybody in our lives that leave us, you know, those memories will like hit you at like these weird times and you will have to shake it off. And sometimes those memories can be like a, a, a big hug that you need, but sometimes it can be really painful and you have to, you know, sit in those feelings for a second before you can shake it off. But I thought that was a little nice little moment about talking about things that we have lost in this life and keeping going. And uh, I don't know. So that, I don't even know why I said that, but yeah, anyways, that's it. You guys, uh, part two with Kate Casey, click on over, listen to that. If you want to keep listening, come on, man, just put an ear pod in at work, sail through the day with me, Ryan Bailey. And so bad. It's good. Thank you guys so much for everything that you've done for me in this show. I really do appreciate it. If you do like this, consider giving it five stars on Apple podcasts and Spotify. You can also watch the video versions of a lot of these over on our YouTube channel. It's so bad. It's good with Ryan Bailey and patreon.com forward slash so bad. It's good. We will be doing recaps at summer house, the new season over there, as well as the traders. So go sign up for that Patreon, patreon.com forward slash so bad. It's good for five bucks a month. You get access to like over 400 shows. I'm recapping the traders and summer house over there. Are you crazy? I need to actually do something with my life, but I'll be over there at Patreon and having a great time. I love you guys. Part two with Kate Casey. Go click over. Bye. 